Hello and welcome to ESPN Cricket for Stump Mike. It's been a while. I'm Karthik Ayer and we're back one day before the restart of Pakistan Super League season 6. With me today to preview part 2 of PSL 6, Daniel Rasool. Daniel, how did we reach here? Firstly, is it a is it a surprise that PSL is starting what seems like pretty quickly after the season was curtailed or suspended? due to a rise in covid cases and secondly how excited are you hey karthik hi guys nice to be here um it is a surprise in the sense that i thought there was no window for the psl um because presume i had ruled out this time of year because it's just in most of asia where cricket happens it's just way too hot for cricket to take place essentially and then and then the hurdles that the uh, psl has had to jump through because at times there were there was conflict with the uae government around quarantine regulations around whether Uh, how many days uh, the PSL could actually use up? Given that immediately after the final, there has to be a 14-day quarantine for the players to go to England, where Pakistan play three ODI and three T20I series, and Pakistan's on the UK government's red list, so that means the players have to quarantine there for 14 days. So there was an absolutely uh, there was a window that they absolutely had to nail because uh, there was no leeway, especially going on further into the last 10 days of June. and the fact that they managed to just about cobble together 15 days um i think is somewhat impressive despite all the pitfalls and all the hurdles and all the doubts for the most part that uh, uh, put the bsl's presumption in peril no absolutely it is it is impressive also we, and we'll get into it considering the facts that there are i think a whole host of protocols in place that should hopefully ensure that the players and and every team member and support staff is is safe from the pandemic slash virus as well along with daniel on this preview episode is shreesha shresh welcome to a part 2 of uh, psl6 you're a t20 fan you're a t20 buff you must be excited for tomorrow's restart hi karthik uh, good to be here yeah so uh, of course i'm a big t20 fan but i'm a big fan of the psl as well and the sad thing about the psl was the tournament got curtailed just when there was sort of streak of chasing teams winning that streak ended you know the team batting first won the last game and that's when just when the psl got exciting it sort of ended so that was a bit disappointing and now we know that the ipl also subsequently got cancelled and so there was a big gap in sort of the thirst for t20 cricket and this is going to quench it for sure so from that angle it's very exciting that the psl is back and uh, uh it's also interesting that many of the teams the way the teams started the tournament the squads look vastly different now at least from the foreign player contingent so that's also going to be a different angle it's almost as if it's a newer squads playing i mean different squads playing across the six teams but just that the points table is not reset so that dynamic is also very exciting and the third thing is that remember this is a t20 world cup here and from what we understand that uh, there is a fairly good chance uh, although everyone all the people in india would like that the t20 world cup happens in india there is a fairly good chance that it happens in the uae and from that angle uh, this is great opportunity for pakistan selectors management the captain and and some players to show how they do in these conditions in the uae and not only do pakistan have a good chance of selecting their largest squad for the t20 world cup from here considering it will be played in the uae but also that the fact that they'll be playing here they'll be way more accustomed or acclimatized to the conditions i mean they are experts already because a lot of psls happened in the uae but some extra prep over the other oppositions does not uh, does not uh, seem like a bad idea at all that's two fantastic spots by shreesh over there 14 games were played uh, before the psl was suspended in the month of february and the first 13 of them were won by the side chasing and finally quetta gladiators beat the multan sultans and secondly we we had an excellent piece uh, danyal on the site recently where where it, where we were trying to dissect why pakistan as a t20i side are slowly falling off the pace yeah after dominating the format for a while maybe 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 this is the spark that they needed to actually contend for that t20 world cup later this year if of course it happens in the uae um yeah so that piece i think touched on a lot of points that uh, people had begun to feel but obviously hasan put that into numbers in in, in a way only he can so i think i, I think it was quite uh, informative for people who had been trying to uh, pinpoint what had gone got lost in the last 
uh, two or three years or so. I think part part of it obviously had to do, as he said, with the, the change in captain, the change in coaching, the way Pakistan have begun to approach um, uh, T20 cricket in general, the loss of certain personnel, there was a purple patch a few players were going through. I guess I, I guess this is an opportunity, um, but the point that Trish made, I think, is more interesting around the World T20. If Pakistan can frame this part of the PSL as a lead-in to a big competition, Pakistan, remember, haven't done well in the World T20 for now, for a good four or five tournaments after, I think, being the best side for the first three editions. So in that sense, I guess maybe they could have tried to um, rope in more overseas players who were perhaps reluctant about playing uh, at this unconventional time in the UAE, given that, as um, as we talked about, there's a good chance that the, that the World T20 happens uh, in the UAE as well. So in that sense, I think even the overseas players that they hit could benefit from that. But Pakistan's trying to be the big winners because just like we were talking about, uh, there was talk about how uh, New Zealand played a blinder in arranging two tests against England before the World Test Championship. Pakistan have done quite well to arrange a decent chunk of the PSL in a place that might host the World T20 in a few months. So in that sense, yeah, there's there's a lot to look forward to for Pakistan fans and T20 fans in general. So so this second stage is going to go on from June 9th to June 24th when we will have the final. It's going to be played entirely in the UAE. As it stands, Karachi Kings are on top. Peshawar Zalmi, followed by Islamabad United and Lahore Kalandas. All of those four teams are on six points each. Then we have Multan Sultans and Quetta Gladiators. Both of those teams are slightly adrift with just two points each. Karachi, Peshawar, Multan and Quetta have played five games. Islamabad and Lahore have the advantage of having played just four games and they will kick-start the second leg of PSL 6 tomorrow with a clash between themselves. Hey, Daniel, what do you remember from part one? Um, it seems a long time ago now because lots, lots has happened since. What I remember primarily was, um, I remember I did the same part with you before the start of the PSL initially and I think I was with Max. And I predicted Quetta to win the whole thing. So, <laughs> so, so, maybe, so maybe I'm not the one to be uh, asking for predictions this time around. But the, the, the thing that I generally remember is it was a resumption, it was a continuation of a trend that Islamabad United had come to master with one season, or when it, with the exception of one season. I think they were beginning to nail um, their style of play and the way, uh, and the way they um, uh, go about the 20 cricket they they used to win the toss, they used to field first, they used to absolutely nail chases. The one game where um, they had to bat first, they lost, which is what their record is. I think they've won only 8 out of 29 games batting first. So Islamabad in that sense are still the team to watch, even though they're third in the table, because I still think they looked the best side. Um, Quota and Multan, of course, have ground to make up. But the good thing about the the time that this got postponed is that no side has been absolutely cut adrift. I think if Quota had won, lost that last game, where they actually ended up being the first side to defend the total, I think it might just have been a four out of five sort of competition, which isn't quite that exciting. But I think now every team is in with a chance, especially with rejig squads. That means every side, in a way, starts from um, square one and uh, has a chance to make amends for the mistakes they've made. Shreyas, Tana is saying that no side has been cut adrift. And I want to start with the bottom two sides because personally, I, I fear that a defeat, if they begin with a defeat, both these sides are pretty much done, especially in this condensed format where there are many of double match days and the season will probably end before it even begins so how do you see Multan Sultans and Quetta Gladiators even approaching this competition so let's start with uh, Quetta Gladiators first and the really interesting thing is that uh, they have Andre Russell in now Russell who wasn't part of the original uh, Quetta Gladiators squad or PSL squad as a whole because uh, some said that he wanted to keep himself uh, fresh for the IPL well, the PSL didn't happen, the IPL didn't happen, and now he's back in the PSL again. So so that's a big game changer for uh, Quetta Gladiators, which will give them a morale boost as well, you know, before the tournament starts. And apart from that, in Pakistan, what happens with Quetta is that they rely a lot on their uh, spin bowlers. And in Pakistan, spin has not been that successful in the PSL, at least last season. But now that they move to UAE, spin will play a bigger role. And Sarfaraz Ahmed is known to be a spin a spinner sort of captain and um, I feel this is a great chance for them to actually rally up uh, with a couple of wins first up and, and just keep moving up as uh, uh, very quickly. So I think that Quetta is actually quite decently placed although they might be at the bottom of the points table because of a few things like the spin advantage 
and of course the availability of uh, Russell. So, but then Russell Shresh is the only player that they got in. I mean, the other franchises have made a few more changes. They lost Banton and and Dale Stain as well. You think they're putting all their eggs in pretty much one basket? No, they have Azam Khan as well, who is currently mm-hmm. high on confidence after making the Pakistan squad for uh, for England. Then we saw how good Fab Duplessis was in in the IPL in 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 those South in those Asian conditions. There's, there's uh, I mean, it's not re- not not really as big of an issue as it as it might seem. Uh, just because the the fast bowlers pressure will reduce from the fast bowlers, what they have to do. Uh, just because Stain is not available in the squad, so there is no pressure to play someone of Stain's magnitude. Right. I felt that they were playing Stain just because it would feel awkward to leave a legend of or someone with those number of wickets out of the team, and that sort of was being disadvantageous to uh, Quetta. So I think. At this point, they, they, they'll be in a good space. And Nasim Shah's fit as well. He's available to play. So, so overall, uh, I'm, I'm actually quite hopeful of Quetta. I think they can actually sneak into the top four. Yeah, about Nasim Shah, Daniel, there was, there was a fear, probably of his own doing, that uh, he would not be allowed to play after that protocol breach. But it seems that the franchise and the PCB maybe have come to an agreement. Yeah, so um, I actually felt for Nasim Shah initially when he was excluded because... Yes, in a sense, it is of his own doing. But then co- with COVID protocols, one thing that the players need is a good support staff around them, a support structure around them. So uh, players at times might not know specifically what the regulations are, but in franchises, that's what managers and that's what um, the entire support teams for. You have to tell the player exactly what they need to do with COVID protocols, which labs they need to get their tests from and what happened and what dates. What happened with the Seam Shah was I think he had a test um, from from the correct lab, and he had a negative test, but the test had been taken more than 48 hours prior. So when he uh, arrived, I think, on the 22nd of May, he had a test, a, a negative test from the 18th of May, and that wasn't good enough. They needed one from the last two days. And because the PSL, after it had been postponed initially, had essentially um, painted itself into this corner where they said, we will absolutely make no ex- uh, exemptions for anyone. Uh, I think the director and commercial head of Babur, of of the PSL Babur Hamid actually said that we will not compromise on any violations. We will expel any player or player support personnel uh, irrespective of their stature, stature and standing in the game if they're found to be flouting the prescribed protocols. So they excluded him. But then when you have when you say something as strong as that, it, it, it does it, it does look quite awkward when three days later you say, well, um, we, we've come to an agreement, we've decided to let him back in because, because then obviously well, what you said two or three days ago, the message that gets completely undermined. But regardless of whether that should have been said or whether he should have been excluded immediately, the fact that he is back is huge for Quetta Gladiators because uh, they had this uh, really fearsome pace contingent. Obviously, Stretch mentioned Stain's not there now. Stain had struggled anyway. But losing um, Stain and Nassim might have been a big blow for a side that actually needs everything to go for them, given that they have points to catch up on. Hmm. There's one thing extremely impressive, you know, about how this PSL restart has been handled, at least according to me, and that's that there wasn't just one draft to bring in replacement players when teams needed maybe a few more to pad up their squads, especially when it went from 18 to 20. They even had a mini draft and maybe, maybe just maybe, Shresh, Multan Sultans have got the best of that mini draft, having bringing in the explosive Shimron Hetmeyer. He's, he's probably likely to fit right into the side. They have lost out on Shahid Afridi, but with, I think, Shibran there and with the fact that they know that they're playing catch-up right from the very beginning. Do you see Multan? I know I know you're saying that Quetta will do well. Do you see Multan being in the same boat? So, Multan's an interesting team because even though they sort of uh, are in the bottom two uh, with four losses, that... They've, the problem is that uh, their their uh, captain has been in amazing form, Mohammad Rizwan. It's just that the others around him, at least from a batting point of view, have not been able to contribute as well as he would have, they would have wanted. And the sort of the fast bowlers uh, struggled a bit to defence scores, which, by the way, was the truth for every team. So eventually it came down to Multan just losing tosses, to be honest. So the ref- them being on two points is not really a reflection of how well or poorly they have played. It's more about how the coin fell if you have to really take that into consideration. So, in that sense, I'm quite hopeful of Multal Sultan as well. Firstly, Rizwan's form needs to continue from the start, from the first half of the PSL. And then they need they need a bit more from, not a bit more, they need people like Shimron Hetmeyer to come up their worth, you know. Uh, these the, Hetmeyer is highly praised player. 
and he's blown hot and cold sometimes. But if someone like Hetmyer can come in and do the job uh, in the middle order, he he'll be a game changer in the UAE. As will Ramanullah Gurbaz. I I expect Gurbaz to actually start the game uh, to to start uh, with Rizwan at the top. And uh, it both both are quite flashy, but Rizwan can take slightly of a back seat and have Gurbaz go crazy at the top, which is going to give Multan the sort of start which the middle order can capitalize on. And apart from that, I think uh, guys like Usman Kadir has have a big role to play in this uh, uh, in this lineup. Uh, Shanawaz Dhani was one of the standout bowlers of the tournament. I think uh, on the first half, I think he was one of the top three wicket takers. So there's a lot going lot going for them as well. Uh, the, the, they don't have Chris Lynn, they don't have James Wins, which might be a blessing in disguise because you don't have to play them and you play people like Gorbaz and Hetmeyer. And remember, they have blessing Muzarabani as well. Muzarabani will get that bounce, will get the ball to do something with the new ball at the top. And his height, uh, it, it, it might work wonders. Uh, even even they're they are, they are in good con- uh, contention. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't feel that Shai Dafridi's absence may be a cause for concern? So, I think, which we'll talk more about, I think the weather conditions in the UAE at this time would make us see a less than satis- less than standard Shahid Afridi, which you've come to expect, just because the toll on an athlete's body playing playing cricket in the UAE day or night in the month of June will have. Uh, I think uh, they will not miss Afridi as much as they would have missed Afridi if we were playing this in March or April. Yeah. Daniel, this has never happened, right? Going by what Shreish said. I mean, we have, I don't think we've ever had cricket, at least in the UAE, in June. Temperatures will reach, what, 40 easy? During the day? Yeah, um, well above 40. Um, I think in one of the Emirates in the UAE yesterday, there's a temperature recorded in excess of, in excess of 50 degrees Celsius. So um, the, the, the conditions are extreme, obviously. And this is why we thought that the UAE wasn't really a viable, but this wasn't a viable window because the UAE isn't really fit to host uh, most high-level cricket at this time. It's just, it becomes a health risk for players unless you take quite extreme uh, Precautions, which I understand the franchises are going to try and take to mitigate the conditions, but once again, uh, um, the, it, this is this is uncharted territory for everyone. One thing I'd quickly like to um, uh, follow on on the Multan discussion, I'd just like to say um, that yes, they have brought in some good. They, they brought in a number of players actually, but uh, I don't see any other franchise being as badly hit in terms of the loss of firepower. Yes, Afridi is perhaps a spent force with the bat, but also Carlos Brathwaite, James Wins, Kristen. These are players who have done well in the BSL. In the past couple of years in Bhutan, since they have had their data revolution, they actually pick players very specifically to fulfill certain roles that they think uh, they've identified in their side for each player. So it's a very fine-tuned squad that if it gets out of kilter slightly, then the replacement begin to feel a bit like, you know, square pegs and round holes. So it remains to be seen whether they can force them to fit. But then again, Rizwan's form is once again the, uh, once again the unknown because no one really expected Rizwan to go on this all-time great run of form. And if he can continue that, that's great. But if he can't, then obviously, uh, suddenly Multan have another problem. So, a bit more uncertainty for Multan than I think some people would expect. So, we know, Daniel, that Shreesh expects both Multan and Keta to put up a fight. What about you? Um, uh, I expect I expect Multan to put up a decent fight, same Teto Quetta. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I also accept that there's, there's ground to make up on. I think they will have to rely on favours from a few of the other four sides in terms of how they go about adjusting to these new conditions and their change personnel. I think once we get to that discussion, I think Islamabad, of course, is another site that relies heavily on overseas batsmen, especially English batsmen. And we know that pretty much no English players are playing at this time because of their home season. So uh, I think it also depends on how the other franchise is going to see if these two two teams can make up ground. Yeah, the T20 Blast also begins on on June 9th. We would encourage you to watch the PSL, but but hey, even the in the Blast is is not bad and. Maybe just maybe on some days the timings will not clash. And about the heat as well, the the organizers have planned and some franchises, coconut water, shreshed, ice collars, lighter kits even, and and more more breaks. We are hoping, you're hoping that this is not going to be a concern. And I think they're going to start games, I think, earliest or latest by five, earliest by 5.30 UAE time to avoid the heat in, in the UAE. Shresh, do you remember in 2012, when Stark, I think it was during an ODI that Stark just bent over and he couldn't continue his overs. Yeah, uh, it, so that that's a real concern. I I remember what distinctly we were talking about, and uh, that's a real concern because Stark that time was sort of at his 
I mean, he still is, but that, that was like peak athleticism. And when he was struggling, I mean, it's a different format though. So, so hopefully this, it, it won't be as bad here. And now scientific uh, science allows people to prepare well in the head for, for, for issues, for issues like dehydration or cramping. There'll be a lot of electrolytes flowing. As you said, the jerseys might be different, ice packs and so on. Uh, one thing I think uh, even viewers and administrators need to go a little easy on is how long it takes for an innings to, to happen. Uh, especially on, on double-headed days, I can I can understand the concern of a time limit to finish the first game so the second game can start. But generally, I would hope that the administrators go easy on that. Uh, a lot of viewers, a lot of purists uh, seem to complain that Cricket 20 over should should end between in one and a half hours, but these are very special conditions. I'll be very okay if if two hours is made into a standard for an innings to be completed uh, in these conditions. Although I know that will not happen because of broadcasting concerns and uh, the second game starting. So it's a, a bit of a give and take needs to happen between administrators and the players on the advice of doctors for sure. Because uh, if you want really top quality cricket, you need the players to be comfortable. You don't want them to be half the half the can. Stress. Will you also will you also be comfortable if you're uh, on ball by ball at half past three in the morning India time and the innings <laughs> is taking two hours to end? I've been there, done that in the CPL. <laughs> This is an interesting question regarding the timings because from what I understand, Daniel, the second game, is it beginning at 11 p.m. Pakistan time? Yeah, that's right. It is beginning at 11 p.m. It, it, it seems unreal. Like, okay, so what, what's the view then in Pakistan? I know you have to stay up to watch it, <laughs> but do you think that it will work when it's beginning so late? 11, 11 p.m. is just too late. Uh, it, it's it's suboptimal. Uh, I mean, there's no way there's no way you could have satis- satisfied every single point when you're trying to host uh, a truncated season of the PSL around a time in the cricket window when there's basically no time. Because uh, obviously, the fact that the, the PSL has to any way the PSL ends is better than this season just being lost, disappearing into the ether. And when you decide that you are going to complete that, come hell or high water, you have to make certain compromises. And once again, it's it's a trade-off between making players play in what are, let's face it, unsafe conditions if they had to play in the afternoon in the UAE, or, well, maybe taking a hit with when it comes to viewership figures in Pakistan. On the weekdays, they're trying to minimize double headers on weekdays, but yes, on the weekdays, if there are games starting at um, 11 p.m., which there are, and then they, they'll probably end around 2.30 a.m., 3 a.m. in Pakistan, yes, you won't get too many viewers around the back end. But once again, you have to get all these games in. The 9 p.m. games are a bit more manageable, even though they're a bit late for uh, uh, for ideal standards. But yeah, once again, it, it's, it's just one of those things where you have to make compromises somewhere, and this is one of those that had to be made because of the weather in the UAE. I don't think it's that big a deal, by the way, guys. Uh, when no? the, you know the Euro 2020s are starting, and the yeah. Euro 2020 is uh, scheduled for 1 a.m. But here's what I'm saying, right? This is the Pakistan Super League, whereas in the Euros... Like you and I and Daniel, who those who watch football, we're, we're used to watching football slash soccer at any order. The point is, would you rather have a tournament happening at all, or would you rather? I mean, I mean, do do, do you want to uh, enjoy the gap of no cricket, or do you want to get some cricket at least for whatever reason? And remember, these games are also talking points for people when they are sitting at home because they have nowhere to go, be it due to lockdown, be it due to. Uh, uh, COVID issues, uh, they need entertainment. And and so be it if, if entertainment starts a bit late in the day. Uh, I think for, uh, for for certain people, like maybe people under 15, uh, people who have maybe have a little bit of strict parents, maybe it'll be a little hard for them to catch up on game. Maybe they have to hide and watch. Maybe they can follow the scores on Cricket Info instead of watching it on television. But apart from that, I think for a 15-day window, uh, uh, 11 a.m., 11 p.m. start is not as big an... I mean, it's not the downside is not as high as it would have been if you'd had no cricket at all. Right, right. I, I think the only the main challenge for for a lot of us here, at least those talking on this podcast, is to try and find four screens to watch uh, the the PSL, the T Twenty Blast, the Euros, and of course, there's a Test series between South Africa and West Indies on similar times as well. So, so that'll be a bit a bit tricky. All right, so let's get back to the cricket and let's talk some about the Karachi Kings, Daniel. And okay, when I say I talk about the Karachi Kings, I'm really not going to talk about their PSL chances because the biggest news for me was Babar Azam's quote saying that he's going to talk to Mohammad Amir about a possible international comeback. 
Okay, I I mean that 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 is the biggest story, right? I, PSL is fine, but Mohammad Amir playing for Pakistan again? Hey, uh, I mean it, it is a big story in that if he's serious about what he's saying, then yes, it's a big story. I'm once again skeptical because I think he was asked a question and he couldn't effectively say that he wasn't abs- he wasn't interested at all in Amir returning. I think it's one of those things where. Amir has burned enough bridges with this particular coaching staff and management that regardless of what Babur says and how persuasive he is, I think it's hard to see Amir coming back because he's not a fan of this uh, of the head coach and the bowling coach and they don't particularly like him much either. So I think I, at the moment, um, all that can be done is ensure that more uh, animosity isn't created. So at some point when conditions are more conducive, when the personnel on both sides are more receptive to talking that Amir can return, it's just, it's just a matter of ensuring that Amir isn't lost forever, which I don't think he is for now. I just think that for the next year or two, don't expect to see Amir back in a Pakistan shirt. All right. So then, Daniel, about Karachi Kings in the PSL, they're of course going to lose their top spot without even playing a game because the match that takes place before them will see that the winner of that of that game between Islamabad and Lahore go on top. But how do you see them faring? They have lost a few players, and I would like to say that Dan Christian's story is pretty interesting because he's not going to play part two. Uh, he was supposed to go to the T20 Blast, and I think we're just getting in some breaking news, Daniel, that he's been called up for Australia. Oh wow! Um, so, well, he, he well in, in either uh, in either case for the Karachi Kings that means he's unavailable and that is a problem. Uh, he was he was one of the stories around this season's BSL because he was coming in uh, on, a, on on the back of some really good form and it it, it seemed like that it was a really astute pick for Karachi to have Christian amongst their ranks. The one worry, the major worry that I have uh, with Karachi is I said before uh, the first um, uh, before the start of the original edition that they seem to lack re- a really good spinner. And uh, uh, at that point, perhaps I was being a bit unfair to Muhammad Nabi, but now that he's gone as well, um, I feel, uh, yeah, I feel like that's even more true because Noor Ahmed is still very, very young. Imad was seen as one of those who will bowl a couple of overs in the power play and then maybe consolidate, but isn't really a quality spinner in that when you need one to blast a few people out or really put the pressure on the way a good leg spinner can. Uh, I, they initially drafted in Litton Das uh, and that he was unavailable as well, so that was a blow. That's the one concern that I have um, with Karachi because other than that, it's it's hard to find too many weaknesses in their side. Not just the original side, but even their side now. I think the fact that they have Mohammad Amir in terms of being a Pakistani T20 bowler in the UAE, I don't think you can ask for more. Obviously, Babar Azam, um, the fact that they got him, they're never going to let him go, uh, means uh, he, uh, me, means yes, once again, they have perhaps the most valuable fast Pakistan, Pakistani fast bowler and the most valuable Pakistani batsman, even if he is more of an anchor than he is a hitter. And obviously, um, Shajil Khan was called up for the national side, and he has a point to prove ahead of the World Cup. I think they're in good space for the most part. It's the fact that they don't have a spinner that really impresses me, and we're playing this edition in the UAE, that's what I'd worry about for them. Shresh, the three players Karachi got in during the draft were Martin Guptil, Najibullah Zadran, and the recently retired uh, Tisara Pereira. Any of those excite you? Well, all three excite me if if Karachi can figure how to use each any of them or all of them, uh, that that's a little bit of a worry because firstly I want to say ki so j- just ab- about that let let's clarify something I think you earlier there was a rule in the PSL that you had to play three foreign players in your eleven and a maximum of four I think that has now changed from you can play just two and a maximum of four yeah so so it's it really how who do you want to make bat where now see joe clark was playing previously he's not available now so do you put in someone like zadran at 3 or do you put in someone like guptil at 3 uh, neither seem i mean zadran is more comfortable at 3 than guptil is because you don't want to remove sharjil and babar from the openers because they might they they want they, they need a lot of batting time ahead of the world cup or even for karachi kings impact now ingram's also missing so who do you christians also missing so how do you play? Who do you play? Where is the big concern? And I think that will be something which uh, Karachi has to worry about in 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 so in case they want to maximize the op, maximize the utility of all the people they have. Uh, maybe maybe what they'll do is they'll have Guptil and Sharjil opening, Babur at three, uh, Pe- Pereira at four or five, Zadran at four or five. They have Chadwick Walton also who usually plays as an opener. So it's 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 a bit of a hodgepodge to be honest with you. Uh, how they utilize and make their eleven is is going to be a big concern, and and this has been a concern with me with Karachi Kings for a long time as well. Although they are, I mean, 
they're, they're exceedingly good and they they won the last season if i'm if i'm not mistaken is that pakistan's t20 captain is not their captain and and that sort of leaves me flummoxed all the time because eventually a, a franchise league also has to think about how you're preparing the the national team from this as a sort of feeder system and if someone like babar azam does not get the opportunity to to make sort of difficult decisions be it selecting players in the 11 or making field changes or or i'm sure he discusses tactics because he's a senior member of the team but if you're not the captain all the time and thinking have the captain's hat or on all the time for your franchise team then how can the national team expect him to be a a, a leader who's going to win your title could it be that Uh, in, in in case it doesn't work out, in case Babar is captain and doesn't work out, you cannot unseat your national team captain. Is could could there be that fear from the franchise's point of view? What I understand is that I think the franchise is more comfortable with Imad Wasim. I get it because uh, sometimes owner captain relationship also helps to to have the team going in a certain direction. And Daniel would probably have more details than me, but I think that is what is dictating the captaincy thing at Karachi Kings, and not it's not Babar Azam. is the captain or not it's like they want imad wasim as captain and if they want imad wasim as captain that is actually hurting pakistan daniel do you have some behind the scenes gossip for us from from the karachi kings camp regarding their captaincy choice the first thing i'd like to say is perhaps you're giving the franchises and the board too much credit by saying <laughs> oh, oh we don't want babar azam because we're taking the long term the ones view i don't think it's anything like that at all i do, <laughs> I, do i do expect i do expect that babar was offered the captaincy he'd take it immediately um in pakistan especially there might be a perception that every season that babar is into captain is a sort of snub to babar by karachi kings especially now that and now that he's become pakistan captain and he he does seem like the more natural choice it's just that in the second season um i think it was the second not the third um the karachi kings made it really what at time seemed like a bold choice in deciding they'd make imad usim captain who was still a fairly young player and they said they were taking a long term view and around those 3 or 4 years as karachi have continued to improve i think they're the only side that have made the playoffs every single year um they've just uh, the, the, the the relationship between imad usim and the owner is fantastic it's spotless and the fact that karachi hasn't done anything dramatically wrong to justify the changing of a captain and if you got rid of imad after he's not really made any mistakes that you could pinpoint in terms of the performances of karachi kings year on year then i i feel like you uh, irreversibly um spoil a relationship that the owner clearly values and imad clearly values so in that sense as stress was talking about the batting lineup and say it was a bit of a hot spot but this is where this is also a bit of a complicated situation because you have to keep imad and babar happy to what i would say is that imad and babar themselves seem to have a very good relationship on the field and off the field and that's what makes it work just about but this is uh, this is one of those situations where you could see some friction as the years go on because babar is going to only grow in stature and importance uh, as far as pakistan cricket is concerned after what both of you all have said i'm sensing sensing that karachi kings despite being top of the table as we head into the restart could be could just be in danger of losing their spot in the top 4 and speaking of babar azam listener Uh, I would recommend you to go on the site and read this excellent feature piece by Gaurav Sundararaman, deconstructing Babar Azam, the T20 batter. It's brilliant. It took me about two or three reads to completely understand every nuance of it. I'll just read out the summary line to you. Azam will likely score 50 runs of around 37 balls every second match, T20 match that is that he bats in. Now make of that what you will, but go and check out the piece. The other team that interested me the most probably among among any other is a uh, Rashid Khan story with the Lahore Kalandars. Shresh, I know that you're a big Shakib Ul Hasan fan. There was this Rashid Khan playing just two games in the start, and Shakib came in, then Shakib opted out, and now Rashid, because of course he's based in the UAE and travel to the UK is not as easy at the at this moment in time. He decided to stay on with the Lahore Kalandars. Is it more of the blow that they lost Shakib, or I mean, having Rashid there is has has to be one of the best decisions that LQ have made. it's a no brainer really i mean any team would prefer rashid over anyone else even if that other person is an all round great all rounder like shakib al hasan i think they would have missed shakib uh, a bit more if shakib sort of uh did some amazing things in the ipl but he sort of did just about average in the ipl you know 
and uh, Rashid Khan was excellent for Sunrisers as well. So Rashid has is in form and he's he'll be he'll be ready to go and uh, do well here uh, because T Twenty cricket is even though he says that he's starting to enjoy Test cricket the most, T uh, Twenty cricket is still where he's the most feared bowler and uh, it'll give Lahore Kalendar a boost as well. The interesting thing is that it's a complicated thing between for Rashid as well. Um, he loves playing in England. He has a lot of following in England. Uh, but uh, the, the the English his English team and Lahore sort of they all had a chat together and they real and they decided that okay let let Rashid stay in the UAE. So Rashid's in a happy space. Not that he's being forced to play here. Um, you know it's a it's a decision that's been taken. Not just because Rashid can't go to uh, England. That is not the case. Uh, Rashid is choosing to be here after having a chat with all sort of all parties concerned. So so, so that's going to keep Rashid in a good space. And since he's here, uh, expect Lahore Kalandas to be a, a very strong team. Um, there's like a very, very lot, a lot of good things are going for them. The only bad thing for them is that they've missed, they're going to miss out on David Visa. Uh, he was he was their sort of pinch hitter, uh, death overs batter, um, who, who can change games. And uh, he will be missed. Uh, as will someone like Samit Patel. Both sort of batting all-round options in the lower half of the batting order. But apart from that, I think they are, in a, they are in a very good space as well. I'm not sure what what how they're planning to see someone like James Faulkner, maybe as a visa replacement, but uh, Faulkner is long past I, I was shocked. I was shocked that he's he's there. I, I honestly thought he was done with cricket. And I know. And then I read up and I realized that Shresh Faulkner opted out of the BBL because he was injured. But... It was it was it was pretty amazing to see Faulkner in in a training kit with with the Lahore Kalandas. Yeah, unfortunately, he does not make uh, the eleven so often. So I think he might be a backup option, uh, but I don't know. Prob if Visa was there, it made sense that he's the backup option for Visa. But now that that foreign fast uh, medium pace fast bowling all rounder is missing. Uh, I don't know if, if, if Faulkner will play. Rash, Rashid Khan, of, of course, leads the way. Uh, they have Mohammad Hafiz, the professor, in great form. Fakhar Zaman in great form. Ben Dunk is available there, the ever-favorite uh, Ben Dunk of the PSL. So, there, there were a lot of good things going for them. I'll be, I'm will be i really interested to also see how Sikuge Prasanna does and uh, whether Tim David gets a game or two or not. Yeah, I was going to actually mention uh, Tim David because uh, uh, I, I, I thought that was the sort of um, pick that Lahore Kalandas would make. They... They're not, they're not really known for being a side that will pick a player that you think, oh, he could be quite impressive, but we don't know much about him. We just selected him because of the numbers. The Hawkelanders aren't really that type of side. But I watched a bit of um, David in uh, the BBL, and uh, then I looked up, I was looking up his numbers um, uh, for the Singapore side yesterday. They are phenomenally good. And then it, I, I, kept, I kept thinking about who he reminded me of, and I feel like uh, this is not a comparison, it's just a comparison of styles. He looks he looks a bit like Inzamam when he's at the crease in that relaxed posture and the high back lift. And, and then and then when you see him go through his shots, the, the really high back lift, and then there's a back speed through his shots. And I, 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 I just I just thought that he's the sort of player that sometimes the PSL picks players who um whose star has either fallen a bit or who aren't really quite appreciated on the nationals on, on the international stage just yet. But they do find a way to carve out a place for themselves in this particular league. And uh, David Visa, in a way, was one of those. Obviously, Tim David's not a replacement for him, but he's someone who I, I suspect he will get a bit of game time. And I do think I, I do think there's a good chance that he's the kind of player who does well at the PSL. I just echo stressed concerns about uh, James Faulkner, and if if Lahore think that he is in any way a replacement for Visa, um, I, I don't see it from the outside. If if they've seen something in Faulkner that we haven't for really since he was man of the match in the World Cup final six years ago then good luck to them. But um, it's not apparent from the outside what he can provide that um, uh, that is serves in any way as a replacement to what we said. Singaporean Tim David and Inzama Mulhak in the same sentence. You will you will <laughs> only hear that. You will only hear that on Stump Mike. Daniel, I'll, I'll stay with you as we as we move on to the next franchise, Islamabad United. You of course got a chance to speak with and interview one of their picks during the draft, Usman Khwaja. Can, can you tell us a little about, about his, his state of mind and what that piece you wrote was on the website was about? Yeah, so a few days ago, um, while the Islamabad players were still in quarantine, um, I, yeah, I had the chance to speak to Usman Khwaja. He's just, he's, he's really engaging to talk to. So we were promised, I think, we were told we only had 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then we went on for 45 and those at no point any sense that he was getting impatient. Um, um, uh, yeah, he was happy to talk. And initially, we were supposed to only speak about the PSL. And that bit 
Um, I, I didn't really write in the piece that's coming out in a few days, but he did speak about his experience in Australia as a Pakistani Muslim. He's he's a bit of a diversity pioneer because he was the first Pakistani player for Aust- Pakistani origin player play for Australia, the first Muslim, and he spoke quite engagingly. I thought he has done in the past as well about how at, initially when he was growing up, when he emigrated with his parents, he didn't really feel like culturally this was a team that was his. He said that as a Pakistani Muslim, they were spraying BB alcohol in the changing rooms, and he thought, do I really see myself in that team? I think in the, he said at the 1999 World Cup, his parents supported Pakistan, and that was around the time he was supporting Pakistan too. But then he said, he said initially he also didn't like to be seen as the Pakistani Muslim. He wanted to be just as Australian as everyone else. But he's come to appreciate how much his, um, uh, his background means to people in Australia who say, oh, we didn't really also support Australia before. We see someone like you on the side. We want our son or our daughter to make it as well because we feel now this is a place that represents all of us. So I think there are a lot of nuances to that story. And uh, as much as Usman Fajr has learned around that time uh, in Australia, I think Australia have learned a lot from him as well. He says he's working with Cricket Australia to try and bring more diversity, not just to players, but also to coaches and the backroom management. And I think in that sense, Australia stands again because there's a huge South Asian community in Australia that hasn't quite been tapped into in the same way as England have managed to tap into their British Asian community, uh, which was another thing Fajr said. So, yeah, lots of angles there. I thought it was quite interesting. And I'm sure that now there's more acceptance in Australia that things need to change in a way that maybe even a decade ago there wasn't. Yeah, in that piece as well, Usman Khwaja, who last played for Australia Shrest in 2019. He last played at 2000, T20I in 2016. He still says, though, that he has he harbors ambition to play for the national side again, and especially with 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 squads that are much bigger than what we have seen previously. Do, do you see Usman Khwaja having having a chance? I think Australia have announced their preliminary squad just now for, uh, for their tour to West Indies and Bangladesh, and... I do not see Kwaja's name here, so so he is going to be available for the PSL. But do you think he has a chance? Competition like this PSL is actually, if Kwaja gets game time, is going to be quite useful because Kwaja actually is a he. I mean, I don't want to say he's, he dominates all the time, but he's fairly consistent uh, for the Sydney team in the BBL. You know, he is the he is sort of the wicket. Him and I think Callum Ferguson are the two wickets which opposition teams always want from the Sydney side, and uh, he's. So, so he he is good in his conditions where he is comfortable. So, can he come out of his comfort zone in someone like UAE dominate the same way? A team, the 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 power playovers uh, that's going to be something which uh, it will be the make or break case for Khwaja. The only issue is that he's he's um, his I think he's best utilized as an opener in 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 the international in the international side, and unfortunately. The two opening spots are David Warner and the captain, Aaron Finch. So that puts him in a difficult position. Uh, we know Warner's found struggling. Uh, I fi- and Finch has been under pressure as well. Okay. Yes, but he's captain. So so that's, yeah. uh, that's the only problem there. So he might be in the squad for the T20 World Cup as well, uh, considering it might be in here and in the UAE or in India and that he, he does sweep well. Uh, but uh, he'll have to really... Uh, he's, he's not in contention right now and... He needs something like a PSL, a great performance here to sort of make people take notice. Yeah, it, it, it does seem like it will have to be an absolutely tremendous season for for Usman Khwaja to make it. Alex Hale, Shresh, a big loss? Or does Khwaja... Khwaja will probably just take his place as a, as a, as an opener, but this was this is Alex Hale's and he was in... I remember there were there was more chatter about him being recalled for England than, than we've had recently. Yeah, it is a big loss uh, because... Uh, in this 11, uh, among the overseas players who they were using, only really person who's cut out for international cricket was Alex Hales. Phil Salt and Lewis Gregory are exciting players, but they are not international, I mean, standard international players. We know that Hales can walk into any team and even probably walk into England, but if it wasn't for his other misdemeanors, that he is not playing for the international side. So Hales will be desperately missed. Uh, how... How they intend to, I think what will happen is they'll have to change their batting style a bit. Uh, if someone like Khwaja opens at the top, uh, maybe with someone like Brandon King, uh, then they need their uh, middle lower order to play in a certainly a different way. They'll want Asif Ali to increase his strike rate, Talat to do a bit more, maybe Shadab comes in at the pinch hitter, Hassan Ali bats maybe slightly ahead of Fahim Ashraf because he can because he can hit it uh, at a much better strike rate. So. 
so hales and salt missing both of the guys were very extremely uh, quick at the top in the power play actually will force the whole side to change how they bat uh, especially if someone like khwaja opens um, with alongside brandon kick or, or or another pakistan player they have colin munro as well who has been out of form uh, i mean not out of form but not the great colin munro which we know from the past cpl days or or new zealand days and uh, maybe they'll give colin munro one more chance just to uh, you know pep him up saying that come on show your worth colin this is your time we know it's not been good for you but show them what you're made of and and sometimes a conversation like that is good enough in a team like this because otherwise with hales missing uh they had janaman malan also who's also missing uh they need they need something special from their players and uh, a a, a munro special will go a long way for them otherwise they're relying too much on their pakistan all-rounders fahim hasan ali uh, shadab khan Daniel, we haven't even referenced Peshawar Zalmi. I I don't know why that is. Maybe maybe their draft picks haven't been as exciting. But I'll tell you what, Fabian Allen, he's 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 a star for me, and I'm excited to see him at least in in PSL if nothing else. All I'll say about Peshawar is, or the first thing they'll say about them is, the reason I love them is I thought they were a bit of an aging squad because they had Wahab Riaz, Shoaib Malik, Kamran Akmal, all these players. And then I was looking at the replacements, and they select Fidel Edwards, 39-year-old Fidel Edwards. So, <laughs> so, so in that sense, I thought, well, at least they're sticking true to their brand. They've selected quite a bunch of, uh, a number of replacements, a few uh, local ones who I think would be inspired as well. I think, I, I think Bismillah Khan and Samin, Samin Gul's done well for them in the past. Bismillah Khan's had his moments in the PSL, not quite as many as he'd like. Um, I, they're just they're just one of those sides that at times uh, they seem to defy. Squad depth, um, regular T20 um, uh, ideas, and they just do well year on year. Um, this year, I thought they were really poorly cut out. Uh, I think Matt and I both had them finishing at the bottom when we did our um, part. And yeah, they, uh, yeah, and you know they 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 were on they were on course to um, uh, essentially prove us wrong as well. So yes, they have Fabian Allen as well, who continues to bolster a side. I think what the thing about Peshawar is how much they continue to get out of their players. Who other people might think are either spent forces or past their best days. So people like David Miller, who there's evidence has continued to do it. He did well in a warm-up game for Peshawar a couple of days ago. Um, Ashoy Malik, Wahab Riaz, Kamran Akmal, all these players do well when they play for Peshawar. Tell me. And the only player that I'm a little worried for and I hope performs is Heather Ali because since the last PSL, his stock has fallen somewhat. He hasn't quite uh, lit up the international stage, even though he has been given a few opportunities. But I feel like when all these players get into the yellow of Peshawar. They have this culture of uh, they have this continuing culture of success and uh, essentially um, a team spirit that from the days of Sammy Darren Sammy continues to inspire confidence in that side. So uh, these they're the side that's the hardest to make predictions for. But uh, I wouldn't be worried for them for now. For now, I just um, yeah, I just eat humble pie and say they are on course to make the playoffs. Yeah, if if listener, if you want a glimpse into this PSL season before before it begins, there's an excellent piece by Umar on the site. It's life inside the PSL bubble in in Abu Dhabi. Shreyas, there is one concern here though, and I was I was reading it and about the new protocols in case, and we don't want this to happen, but in case a player tests positive, I think there is a quarantine period of a minimum of fifteen fifteen day, to ten days at least, which effectively in the shortened tournament means. If you lose a player, you're going to lose them for the entirety of the tournament. Yes, that is a concern. I guess um, I I don't know if this is a reference to a particular player or, or team when you when you say that, but I think no. I was I was thinking like like again. You used the Euros earlier. I'll use it just before the Euros started. There were a couple of I think there was a Welsh player who goes tested positive, and then they have protocols in place that maybe allow them to come back in. But but that that may not be the case with Sergio Busquets in Spain. So I think we're looking at. We're looking at maybe these kind of cases happening more. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think in the UAE, uh, uh, touch wood. Hopefully, uh, I don't jinx it, but I don't think in the UAE, uh, bubble breaches are so much of a concern. Uh, that's because I think from a UAE government perspective, things are uh, much more stricter. PCB has learnt its lesson from the first edition, so they'll be extremely strict as well. Add to that that they are all playing in just one city, Abu Dhabi. There's no movement. Uh, so, so with all those things in consideration, I think it could be a flawless tournament the way the IPL was last year as well in the UAE. All and they use three cities. So, so from that, from that thing, I don't see that. I don't think COVID uh, could possibly cause as big a ruckus this time 
uh, also players many of the players are partially vaccinated some might be even fully vaccinated so so for th- for those reasons i don't think covid is going to cause uh, much havoc uh, on this occasion pcb has learned its lesson in the hard way they said that it's not i mean uh, not exact terms but they've said that it's not about making money it's about the reputation of of a global league like the psl which they're trying to do here so they're not going so no cost is too much to ensure that it's a covid free tournament and so that's why i don't think it uh, anything will go uh, wrong this time and hopefully that's the case yeah yeah and all, all we want to see is some good quality cricket danyal final word with with you psl 6 it's it's happening over over two parts which is rather unusual but it's something that we've gotten used to so far how do you see this season going and is your excitement level now slowly starting to build there will be no crowds but unlike when psl happened in in pakistan where there were a few people in the in the stadium there will be no crowds so how much are you looking forward to this tournament it's really beginning to build now i i feel i feel like i'm a bit more excited for this than i was for the psl originally i think you asked me to mark it then and i don't think it gave it a very high number for some reason um the thing the thing that excites me about uh, the psl this time is uh, this is where uh, teams really essentially um earn their money in terms of deciding uh, how to comprise uh, what uh, what players comprise their squad because obviously now that they don't have access to the best players that they did in february and march they had to rely on some very unusual players who at times might not make it into um uh, elite t20 squads and then again there are some players people like martin kaptil who are now available and who've never played in the psl before so it's just a new element that gets introduced to the psl under russell's inclusion now is a big help. 